Welcome everyone today. This is uh, the um, Understanding Design Systems webinar from Think Company. Uh, we're going to be going till about 4 p.m., although uh, Sean and I can stick around till as late as 4.30 if we need to. Um, if you don't know Think Company, we are an experienced design and technology consulting firm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, we uh, often do a lot of talks out in the community and at different uh, um, conferences and seminars about uh, topics in design and technology. And since uh, we're all quarantined at home, we decided to uh, move all these online. Um, this is the fourth in the speaker series we've been doing. We do about one a week. And um, this has been going great so far. We've had a lot of great participants, a lot of great uh, um, participation. So uh, Sean's gonna be speaking in a few minutes about um, design systems. But uh, before we get there, just to talk about our, our upcoming webinars uh, next week on April 23rd, uh, we have a panel discussion that we're gonna try out. Um, several of our designers and technologists have been uh, sort of working around um, figuring out how to uh, you know, keep doing their creative work, but keep doing it at a distance. Um, and so uh, Dan Singer, uh, one of our senior designers, is going to be moderating a conversation with uh, Allison Drexler, Danielle Traits, and Ryan Colleen. Um, so we'd love to have you join. Uh, maybe we'll make it a little interactive discussion. And folks can share their tips and tricks for uh, managing creative projects at a distance as well. We're, we've been really pleasantly surprised at how effective uh, we've been without uh, all of us being able to commune in a single space. So I'd uh, love to... Um, Love to continue that conversation and share uh, share that conversation with you as well. So next week, uh, keep an eye on our social media, and we'll have uh, links at the end of this talk also, and share them in chat for you to uh, um, to be able to uh, uh, join that webinar. Um, there's also another webinar coming up on April 29th. Uh, we partner with Philly Kai, which is a local Philadelphia uh, design group. Um, uh, every year we do a So You Want To series. This year it's So You Want To Be a Successful UX Practitioner. I'll be moderating that. We have uh, folks from um, Vanguard, Elsevier. Uh, uh, we also have folks from um, Think Company, Abby DiPrimo, uh, as well as uh, Dan Mall from Super Friendly to talk about um, basically, uh, you know, what, what folks uh, are seeing when they're hiring out in the workforce or when they're looking for people uh, in the world of design. Um, to help other folks uh, hone their skill set, uh, either when they're just entering into the workforce in the world of UX, or if they're, uh, you know, looking to to change jobs or um, you know learn new skills. So uh, it's always a lively conversation when we do this series, and uh, we invite anyone who's interested in uh, having a conversation around that to come in. Keep an eye on Philly Kai and keep an eye on our social media channels as well for a sign-up information for that. I think it's a, a, a it's already pretty uh, pretty filled up. But um, now that we're doing this online, uh, our limits are, are much higher, so we can still accept folks to sign up for that. So before we get into the webinar, just so everyone knows, um, we've uh, uh, muted everyone by default in the webinar. Uh, we will have a live Q&A around 3.45, and uh, if that goes for just 15 minutes, then we'll stop at 4, but we may go as long as 4.30. Some of our webinars have gone that long, if anyone wants to stay. stay. Sean and I have the time. Um, throughout the talk, you can post any questions that you have in the Q&A feature. Some folks have actually sent questions ahead of time, so I might be seeding those questions in there as well. But use the Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen uh, for any questions. Um, I'll be monitoring Q&A while Sean talks, uh, and we'll choose questions uh, for uh, the Q&A session at the end from that um, Q&A feature. So you can also upvote questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to pick the ones that are upvoted the most and embarrass Sean um, with, the, with the worst questions there for him. So <laughs> we give him a hard time. If I select your question, um, I will try first to unmute you and actually introduce you to ask that question of Sean yourself. Um, we prefer to have this be like sort of an interactive conversation. Um, if you don't wanna be unmuted or don't have a microphone or don't wanna deal with that, you can post your questions anonymously and then I'll, I'll play your role and ask those questions for you. Um, just a warning, we may not get to all of your questions. We didn't uh, on one of our sub webinars, but we tried to. Um, and also we have some folks from Think Company who are moderating in chat QA, so there may be a, um, a question or two in there that we can answer before Sean has the time to answer those and, and we'll engage with you uh, in those channels. So without any further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, Sean Hickman. So Sean's an imaginative visual UX and, I'm sorry, an imaginative visual, visual and UX designer. Um, he's worked with our clients uh, such as Ascensus, Transamerica and Comcast um, to conceptualize and bring life to visual systems, uh, large and small. He's uh, practiced in leading research interviews and engaging thoughtfully with people who use products he believes strongly that candid feedback and user input always leads to the most valuable outcome. Um, Sean also has a knack for designing products and iOS app design. Um, he claims he's just tinkered in iOS development, but if anybody has any time, go to uh, the app store on your 
iPhone and download Sofa, uh, which is this great little tool that you can use to organize your downtime by creating lists of books, movies, TV shows, podcasts, albums, video games. I use it all the time. I pick on Sean uh, whenever I uh, have challenges with it and he immediately fixes my bugs. So I love him for that. Um, Sean is very optimistic and he's probably one of the, one of the funniest guys that, uh, that works at Think Company. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce Sean. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for the plug too, man. Sure. Surprise yeah, I plug. I, I thought I'd give a little plug for Sofa out there, even though I, 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 long, I lovingly call it Couch, but it's a great app. People should uh, definitely download it and try it out. <laughs> your, uh, your check is in the mail. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. So, um, so today we're going to talk about understanding design systems. So design systems is a very big topic. Um, there's a lot of parts of it that you can go super deep on. And we wanted to start off with just kind of this high level definition and understanding of it so that for kind of future conversations we have, uh, you know, everyone kind of has that foundational knowledge, right? And, and since design systems is like a very uh, buzzwordy thing today, um, there tends to be a lot of either like surface level understanding or just misunderstanding of what it is and what it isn't. So, um, so really the focus of today is kind of that high level understanding of things. Um, and, and again, you, we can go into much deeper topics uh, about different things in the future. Uh, it's always good to start at the beginning. Uh, so this will be a very brief history. Uh, one of the things you'll, you'll come across as you dive deeper into design systems is this book, called a pattern language. Um, this, you know, the idea of reusable patterns that we just take for granted today, a lot of that was uh, heavily influenced by the ideas within this book by uh, Christopher Alexander. Um, and, and his framing was really around, you know, architecture and, and towns and, and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of those concepts have carried through, um, through design systems and even to things like object-oriented programming. So it's a lot of interesting, interesting history there. Um, another thing that you'll hear or probably know about is something called a style guide, right? Um, style guides have been around for a, a quite a long time and really they're, they're mostly a tool on the design side of the house, right? Um, but it, it's something that, that you'll definitely think about and, and hear quite often when it comes to design systems. This other piece is pattern libraries um, and for any developers in the group, um, this will be no surprise. Um, you know, it's, it's a similar concept to a style guide, but really geared more towards the, the development side of the house, right? And design systems, um, you know, really are, are trying to bring that stuff together. You know, design systems really this amalgamation of a lot of different concepts and ideas um, from both design and development. But the, really the big important takeaway here is that design systems, even though they're called design systems, which is kind of an unfortunate name, um, they are really for both design and development. So it, it's really an important partnership that, that needs to be there for them to be successful. Now let's hit on the value a little bit. Um, this is something that comes up quite a lot. Uh, you know, I, I know there, there are probably some questions around like, how do we get a company to even invest in this kind of stuff? Um, there's a lot of different ways to frame the value of things. Um, but for design systems, there's kind of these, these three bigger buckets that, that tend to be uh, a big part of it. So number one, you know, scaling your product and people. Um, you know, design systems are really intended for scale, right? They're a tool to help you scale, help your designers and developers scale, help your product scale, that kind of thing. So it, it really helps uh, with the efficiency aspect, the cohesiveness across you know, many products, many product teams, that kind of thing. Uh, another thing is shipping features to customers faster, right? Um, you know, getting things out the door a lot faster, uh, especially as like the, the kind of ascendancy of, of agile methodology. Um, you know, design systems fit into that very, very nicely. Um, they're really a tool to help speed things up, to help uh, really improve the, you know, the quality of things, not just getting things out the door faster, but, you know, with that higher quality. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, modernizing your design and development process, right? Like it's not uncommon for us that uh, when we are working with different clients, you know, maybe the technology behind a product uh, is, is fairly outdated 
or, you know, the team itself, um, you know, is just working in, in kind of like older processes with older tools, that kind of thing. Um, and design systems can be a really nice catalyst for, for triggering the change um, uh, that, that's kind of needed to, to even in, improve a product, right? Because there's a lot that goes, goes on behind the scenes from a tooling and a process perspective before anything hits a customer. And uh, one of the interesting things, so Figma is a, uh, it's a, it's a newer UI design tool um, that's, that's growing in popularity, but one of their data scientists had done um, a test to kind of see the, you know, the efficacy of a design system. So, hey, if we give a design system to designers, does it actually make them more productive, right, and more efficient? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, it does, right? And, and what they found was, you know, a 34% increase in, in designs being completed. Um, and if you kind of, you know, quantify that into people, it ends up adding even additional designers to a team, you know, within a single week. The other part too is design systems tend to be thought of as, well, that's like what the big tech companies can do, right? Like, so Apple and Google, they can, they have the resources to invest in this. They can do that kind of thing. Um, and that's definitely true. And they, you know, Apple and Google have, have made great strides here when it comes to, to system work. Um, but this is, this is really spreading out across a lot of different industries, not just quote unquote tech companies. Um, it's even spread out to governments, right? So the two at the bottom here are the, the UK government and the, the, the US uh, government. And what's really interesting about this is that, you know, these, these companies, these industries are, are seeing the value in systems, right? and how it can help them scale and help them to be more inclusive, that kind of thing. So it's not just something for, you know, the, the richest tech companies. It's, it's really something for, for any company. And uh, another big value is, you know, and, and this is something that like really can't be stressed enough is that it's, it's really, really important to hit on the fact that this is a true partnership between design and development. Um, again, like design systems, it, it, it is kind of a bad name because it, it tends to think like, oh, it's just for designers. Um, but if, if an organization doesn't, you know, if design and dev doesn't, don't have that kind of respect for each other and can't work well together, it's going to be difficult uh, for them to, to do this well. Um, but design systems can help to kind of bring that stuff together, which is really nice. So let's actually get into like what a design system actually is? It may sound like an obvious question, but um, it, the, the answer can be fairly deep here. So this is probably the first thing you think of when you hear design systems, right? You probably think of the, the stuff, right? The UI, the buttons, the date pickers, the colors, all, that, all those things that we all get excited about. Um, and, and this is definitely true. Um, this is a big part of design systems, but it's not the only part of design systems. Um, and it, it's really better to think of uh, systems as a product, right? Not just a project. It's not just like, oh, we'll make this system for the next six months and then we'll be good forever. Um, you really need to treat it as a product. And it's you know, the main difference here being that it is your product and then it's an, it's an internal product that serves your other products, right? Um, and, and that product needs to be uh, resourced. It needs to be given the attention it needs uh, to actually grow and evolve over time. If we kind of step back and think about the, the problems that a system is even trying to solve. So as a team uh, or a product grows, you know, and just, you know, becomes more complex, uh, all the things that are required to continue working on that become more difficult, right? So any kind of coordination, any kind of communication, the tooling, you know, it's not uncommon for you know, a product that was once very small and is now large to, you know, be breaking at the seams because of, process stuff or tooling doesn't quite handle at the scale, right? Um, and this is where, where systems are, are, you know, design systems really come in to help solve these kinds of problems. Um, and, and really at their core, they, they help align product teams, right? Um, you know, with the things like styles, components, and patterns, right? Like those things that we, we all think of, but even beyond that with guidelines, best, best practices, and, and process-related things. And if you think about the, the kind of like, well, what, like, what is in a system? Like, what is it? Like, what are the tangible things? It's, it's these three buckets. So you have the UI library, um, which is what we all know and love. 
Uh, but then we have these two other pieces, the storefront and the strategy uh, part, which we're going to get into as we go through this, this presentation. So for the UI library, this is, you know, again, that, that set of styles, components, patterns, right? And this is really the tangible stuff that the designers and the developers um, are going to be using to create their products, right? To create that user interface um, and to really move things forward. Um, so some things that this could contain are, you know, tooling for the designers, which is things like the sketch library um, or even like for, you know, Figma is like a new tool that's, that's growing. Um, on the dev side, that's things like storybook with coded components uh, inside of it. And then there's various things for, uh, for more native uh, systems. And then you have the documentation part, right? Which is the documentation for, okay, so I have, I have this thing like a date picker. How do I use it? When do I use it? Um, and the documentation is really there for both designers and developers to help them, you know, really decide how I should use this thing, when I should use it, what, what do I need to know about it, that kind of stuff. And some of the more famous um, or popular examples of this um, are probably things you've heard of. Um, so Lightning Design System from Salesforce, uh, Material Design from Google, and Polaris from Shopify. Um, these are all really great examples of, of systems that they're not just brand new and they're not just there to be flashy. They are actually being used by these teams and being actively worked on by, by essentially a systems team to, to evolve it, to work with the product teams and to put things out there that are actually useful. Um, and they span across both design and development, right? It's not, it's not just a style guide for the designers and it's not just a pattern library for the developers. So, the storefront, uh, this is probably my favorite part of systems. Um, it's kind of like the unsung hero a little bit. Uh, we, we had, a, we had a, a previous client say that to us, like, oh, the storefront's like kind of like the un, unsung hero. And it's like, yeah, you're right. Um, the storefront conceptually is really just the source of truth for system information, right? So think of you're brand new on a product and you're a designer or you're a developer and someone says, Oh yeah, we have this, we have this design system. You're like, Oh, okay, cool. How do I use it? Where do I go for this stuff? Right? It's like, Oh, you go to the storefront. That is where you go to get that information, right? That's where any kind of process related stuff, any documentation around the UI library, any kind of tooling you need, that is where you can go to get that information. So if we kind of break this down a little bit. Um, you know, on one side, you have the stuff, right? That process, that guidelines and the, and the tooling piece. And then you have the people on the other side who need access to it, right? And those people might be designers, they might be developers, um, they might be multiple product teams, but really the storefront acts as that delivery vehicle for that information to those people. And there's a lot of different levels to this too, right? So you can have like a really small starter uh, version of this. And then you can have like really large ones that scale up to like an enterprise environment. So in something like a, a starter environment, you may have things like getting started guidelines, you know, the UI library documentation, maybe some, some stuff around contributing to the system. Um, and maybe this is just for like a sing, <clears throat> excuse me, a single product team. And you can use a tool like Confluence to act as that storefront, right? Because you know, the team, everyone has access to it. It's, you know, it's already being paid for. It's easy to edit, that kind of thing. You know, as a system starts to level up and becomes maybe a little more complex, this is where you could use, uh, you know, a tool like Storybook, right? That can, Storybook is actually adding some, some interesting features where uh, it, it serving as a storefront is actually a viable option, um, the way you can document things. But, you know, as this grows, you can see how your, your system can kind of evolve and your storefront can evolve, um, even the tooling itself. And then within something like an enterprise environment, um, you have a lot more stuff that, that maybe needs to be within, within the storefront that are, is not just UI library related, um, because this needs to serve multiple product teams, right? And those, those multiple product teams might be all around the world, right? Um, around a country, that kind of thing. And they may be, a, you know, a very different mix of designers, developers, product owners, that kind of stuff. And having something that's maybe more custom built um, helps to be that kind of central place for, for, um, 
for what should be in system and how people access it. Now, strategy. So um, strategy, this is really like this mix of uh, like governance and just operations um, and kind of like product strategy too. And this is really where, you know, if you think about that idea that a design system is a product, this is really emphasizing that point, right? Because it's really like, hey, if you have this product, it's like, what's your strategy for this product? How will you just maintain this internally? How will you staff it? How will you communicate stuff out? How will you get customers, right? And the, the you know, the maybe weird thing here is like the system uh, team's customers are actually like their coworkers, um, you know, within the company, but, but that's really what, you know, that's really like a good way to think about it. Um, but the strategy piece is, is a core part to the system because it's not, it's not uncommon that we, we see, um, you know, people have created UI libraries or pattern libraries or multiple, ver you know, multiple pattern libraries, but they just haven't really caught on and haven't been successful. And usually it's because there was no real strategy put into it around, well, how are we going to support this? How are we going to, you know, maintain it long-term? How are we going to get people onboarded to it? That kind of thing. So, you know, that's a high level um, kind of definition for what is a design system, what's inside of it, that kind of thing. Um, what we're going to focus on now a little bit is the, you know, an approach you can take to uh, tackling this stuff, right? So there's kind of two main buckets that you can focus on uh, when you start to do system work. Number one is discovery, right? This is really focused around like understanding what you're about to embark on. Um, and then the other piece is execution, which is really focused on go doing, you know, go do the thing, right? Like once you actually understand what you're going to build, who it's for, um, then you can go do it. Right. And again, this really is not different than product development, right? If you think about how you would create a product for customers and get it out the door and ship it, um, you, you know, you would follow a similar process to this. So discovery focuses on three things, um, the product, uh, the technology and the design. Um, and depending on the, uh, the products that this is for, um, the team members, that kind of thing, there will be various levels of depth within each one of these buckets. Um, but we're going to go into kind of each one of these things, but, um, you know, the product stuff is, is really understanding the products before you get into it. Um, who is this system for? Uh, the technology, you know, and, and the design pieces is, is very similar, just focused on in kind of the different roles within a team, but understanding the limitations that they have, um, the problems that they have, how a system could help them um, or maybe not help them get in the way, you know, maybe a system would get in the way in some areas and it's good to understand those things. So if we look at something like product analysis, again, this is the part where you know, especially at large companies where there are a lot of different products and a lot of different product teams, it's important before you go build a UI library and say, here, go use this thing. You have to understand what you're going to be building this for, right? What types of products are there? Um, what types of teams are managing those products? Uh, what are their goals? What are their customers like? That kind of thing, that, that kind of thing, like really understanding the, the products, uh, you know, fairly deeply. Um, and not every product is going to be ripe for adoption of a system, right? So what you're seeing on the right-hand side here is this kind of this kind of model you can use to figure out if a product or, or even like a feature of a product is even a good fit for uh, adoption of a system, right? So you have greenfield in flight and maintenance, right? And the idea here is that you know there's there's going to be various various stages of a product within a within a company and sometimes products are in more maintenance mode, right? And they're not really actively being worked on from a feature perspective um, and trying to focus them on adopting the system um, really isn't worth the effort um, because, you know, the technology might be really old. They may not have the resources to actually implement that kind of thing where uh, the, the best opportunities are really in the green field, right? Um, and, and even in, in flight where, you know, maybe things haven't really started yet or they have started, but they haven't shipped yet. Um, and the team is actively working on new things, making improvements, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, from the technical side of the house, um, this is where, uh, you know, if you think about, okay, we, we, we understand what products this is going to be for, then it's like, okay, you know, there's some basic questions around, well, what technologies are those products using today? Or what do they want to move to, right? Are they going to be using React? Um, are there native components to this where, you know, they're spread across the web, iOS and Android? Um, there's a lot of things to understand there. There's even things around the um, capabilities of, of the teams that will be adopting the system, right? Like what kind of blockers will be there for them to adopt this, right? From a technical perspective, from an education perspective, that kind of thing. Um, so spending time uh, on the technical side of the house, you know, talking to developers, talking to team leads, that kind of thing to understand this is gonna be uh, really important before going out and, and building anything. And then if we look at the design side of the house, um, it's gonna be very similar to development, but more focused on design. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, not every product team within a company is going to have a designer or any designers, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that design isn't happening. Um, there's always design decisions happening, whether or not a quote unquote designer is there. So um, knowing that is actually really helpful um, in figuring out how do we communicate this system stuff. Um, we actually did, um, we did a, a system back in the summer for a team that didn't have any designers at all. Um, and they're, the people doing design were, were more of the, the product owners. Um, so we spent a good amount of time, uh, you know, walking them through, hey, here's how you can even use a tool like Sketch to kind of create some mock-ups and use the components that we had put together. Um, and even within the documentation, we had provided some guidance on, hey, if you want to learn more about design, um, here are some good options, right, to kind of just provide some general education for this stuff. So there, there's a, you know, there's a lot of variance within um, organizations and, and even within product teams within an organization. So being able to account for that stuff is, is important um, before going to build anything, right? Um, and some of the things you may do here are like, you know, doing a UI inventory and audit of the various products, right? And this, this is what you're kind of seeing on the right-hand side here. The idea is that, you know, this can help you map out, well, what are the, what are the components we even need to build um, and design for that kind of thing? Now, as part of um, the discovery phase, again, we hit on the product, the technical and the design side. And this is just giving an overview of the, of the process here for how this would work. So again, we do the discovery piece and this is, you know, this is not uncommon for, for any, you know, real product design effort where it's like understanding your customers and understanding the, the problems that they're trying to solve, right? And before you go, you know, design and build a solution. Um, and then we have this, this piece in the middle of this execution plan, which is, hey, before we go build stuff, let's, you know, let's align, let's, let's have some, some uh, synthesis here around the goals and the guiding principles that we're trying to achieve here. Um, putting together a roadmap for this stuff, um, you know, defining like what the business impact is, um, any kind of measurement, measurement or KPI related stuff. Um, and then the, the things in the middle of the system model, um, which is really tied to the three pieces on the right, and then the d design and dev tooling, um, that starts to get to be very in the weeds around like, all right, these, these are the technologies that these teams are going to be using. Uh, even if they're not using them today, they're gonna be using, using them in the future. Um, but really this plan is, is helpful to get, um, you know, the right stakeholders aligned on, okay, here's what we learned, here's what we plan to do, now we're gonna go do it. Um, and then on the right-hand side is the execution side, right? So this is where we go build stuff, right? This is where we go design and build the UI library. We, we stand up the storefront and, you know, populate it with, with all the content that it needs. And then for the strategy side, it's like, we're going to go define, you know, those specific strategy topics, um, document them, that kind of thing. So, and that's what we're going to jump into next, um, the execution piece, right? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each one of these. Um, so let's do it. So again, the UI library, um, this is where, you know, this is that, that stuff that everyone knows about the styles, the components, the patterns, right? Um, but 
when we're kind of starting with this, um, if you if you think back a few slides to where we, it said UI inventory and audit. Um, one of the things we would do as part of that discovery phase is to, you know, do an inventory and audit of all the products that we're going to be building the system for, right? And this is where there's these kind of high level groupings of of components and patterns and styles. This is what you're seeing here. And we will go through and we would identify like, okay, so we need these things, we don't need these things, um, and, and kind of put that together in, into a, a, what we would call a system model that would allow us to, to say, all right, here's the clear plan for the things that we were going to initially build into the system um, from a design and development perspective and document these things, right? And, you know, it's, it's good to have these high level, um, kind of more generic, uh, level components and styles. And then, you know, obviously as we get into specific products, there's going to be more uh, nuanced and specific components that are, you know, more specific to that kind of product, right? Um, and there's things within this grouping too that are going to be there always, like they're kind of default, like anything within the primitives and the controls and inputs buckets. Um, every product is going to need those things. Like every single product is going to need a color system, um, typography, spacing, buttons, all that kind of stuff, right? So there's, there's a lot of just like kind of gimmies that you can do here, but then there's going to be things that are, are a little more specific. Um, and that, that system model exercise um, can be really helpful to prioritize things too, right? Because as you're working on the system, it's, you know, there's going to be things that aren't, it's like, oh, is that like something we need right now or is that something in the future, right? You know, um, you know, I immediately think of like data viz that those are things that are, you know, it's, it's better to start pretty, pretty simple there and then get more complex over time. So the storefront, um, again, the storefront is that, that single source of truth for a system. Um, you know, one, one really good example that you're seeing on, on the right-hand side here is from Atlassian. Um, and they do a really good job of uh, bringing brand marketing and product together, um, which are traditionally, you know, maybe a little bit of friction or maybe even at odds with, with one another. But, um, when you really think about the, the high level problems that like a marketing team and a product team needs to solve, um, they're fairly similar from like a systems perspective. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of tie this stuff together, but for the storefront tool specifically, um, you know, you can, you can definitely get into the weeds of, well, how do we even choose a storefront tool? Like, what do we do here? Because there's, there's a lot of options. Um, and we found it helpful to kind of bucket it into off the shelf and custom built, right? Because you don't always need one or the other. Um, so for things like off the shelf, you know, keeping the team, you know, or sorry, let me say, the, if the team is like small, um, and doesn't have a lot of time to go build something custom and maintain that thing. Um, that's where something like off the shelf is, is a, a better option. Um, maybe the team doesn't have the technical abilities, right? Like maybe it's, maybe it's a bunch of designers and like one developer and they just don't have it at the moment. So it's like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll do something more off the shelf. Right. Um, and then there's like, you know, some, some issues where with large companies getting things approved, that kind of stuff. Um, and some good off the shelf tools would be things like Confluence, which we talked about earlier. Um, tools like Notion and uh, Storybook. Storybook is like kind of in the middle, like custom and off the shelf, but it is kind of off the shelf. Um, on the custom side, you know, when would you want a custom storefront, right? Like if you actually look at all the design system ex examples out in the wild, they're all custom built, um, but they're all showcasing things like they're kind of doing promotion too, right? So that kind of makes sense. Um, but one of the main reasons that you would want to do something that's a little more custom is um, if you are in a large organization that this system needs to serve multiple product teams and there isn't a single internal tool that all those product teams can access, right? Um, so for anyone who's worked at large companies, this will not be a surprise, but you know, team A might use Confluence for everything, right? But team B might use SharePoint and team C might use something else. Um, and if we had put the system in any one of those tools that the other teams couldn't see or couldn't access, um, that really would not be ideal. Uh, it's important for the system to be visible and accessible to everyone who needs it. 
Um, so that's where, you know, that's probably like the biggest reason why you would want something more custom built is um, that it just helps those people access the information that they need. And then strategy. Um, so again, strategy is like, that operations and the governance piece that is really all the behind the scenes things that we probably all take for granted with all the products that we, uh, we use and love every day. Um, things like zoom that we're using right now, right? There's a lot of, a lot of strategy, a lot of ops that go into that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, within the strategy for a design system, there's a lot of different things that you can hit on here from, you know, how are we going to support the system, right? There's a lot of ways you can do support. There's very like lightweight ways you can do that. You can say, all right, we're going to set up a Slack channel. And if people have questions, they can put them in there um, or set up like a, you know, a Google form or something. Um, but in like a really large enterprise environment, you might see, you might need something that's a little more robust than that. Uh, when it comes to like communication channels, um, you know, letting people know that there's new features or new components or bugs have been fixed, um, or even just promoting it and getting awareness of, of the system. Um, there's a lot of different channels that you can use to do that. Uh, the team operations piece, which is really focused on like, how do we like do the system? How do we like operate as a team? Um, you know, there's things like the roadmap in there, adoption strategy, um, release process, like that kind of stuff. And, and again, like a lot of these things are not not unique at all, right? Like there, this is really just product development, right? This is the kind of stuff you need to do when you're developing a product. Um, and I'll kind of say like, you don't have to do all of these right away, right? There's, there's a lot of ways to get started with design systems that is more lightweight and then you can evolve it over time. It's not like, oh my God, we have to do all this stuff right now. Um, it's really, you know, focusing on like, what are the most important things uh, and then kind of going from there. All right, so we're gonna give some, we'll go into a little bit of high level, like how you would get started with this kind of stuff. Um, like I said at the beginning, design systems is a very big topic. There's, you know, we could go deep on just storefronts, right? Or just strategy, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot to talk about here. Um, but before we get into the QA, I know we have about five minutes. Um, <clears throat> I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about how you could get started with these things and um, some things to kind of think about and consider when you're doing that. Um, so there's a lot of scenarios within a company that would dictate how a, how a system needs to be implemented or should, um, but there's kind of two, two basic ones, right? Number one is like starting from scratch, which is, hey, we don't, we don't have anything. We've never done this before. What, where do we start? Um, and then the other is, you have system stuff. You may have an existing system or a pattern library or style guide or something, right? Or maybe you have multiple pattern libraries today. Um, and how do you evolve it, right? Like how do you, you don't wanna just throw everything away. You wanna evolve it and, and maintain it and, and grow it. Um, so starting from scratch, you know, number one, prioritizing, um, you know, the buy-in. And, and just getting people aware of something like this. Um, because to, to do this kind of well and to, to have it have that long-term effect, <clears throat> excuse me, there's, there's collaboration that's needed, there's, there's awareness, and then you, know, you need people to adopt it, right? So as, you know, as a systems team, the number one metric is adoption. It's like, our team's using it, right? And if they're not, then it's like, well, why aren't they using it? Do they not know? about it or is it not good? Is it not solving their problems? That kind of thing. Um, so it's never too soon to start putting, putting it in people's heads, planting that seed and, and starting to talk about it. Uh, the second one is like identifying a small number of products to start with. Um, again, you know, it, it's, it's tempting to say like, oh, we're going to create this one system for every single product right away. And that really may not be the most practical way to do this um, because there's a lot of uh, expectation settings with these teams. Um, and there's a lot of things that like the team's gonna learn and evolve over time. And having a smaller number of products to start with, um, to kind of build things up, to test them, um, to build some like robustness into them is, is gonna be really helpful for that team. 
right? It, it, this is kind of like an MVP approach to product design, right? But for design systems. Um, really spend time understanding what those products need, um, the problems they're trying to solve, um, like the, the people that they have on the team, like do they have designers or do they not have designers? Um, you know, what technologies are they, going, are they going to be working with? Like what is, what could a system help them do and help them achieve and, and that kind of stuff? Um, spending that time understanding that and empathizing with those team with those product teams um, is going to be really helpful because that that's actually going to increase the likelihood of, of them adopting it in the future. Uh, allocating people's time to work on the system. Um, this is probably the number one reason that most systems fail um, is, you know, there's, there's a lot of excitement. It's like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to make this system. And, you know, you make the initial system with the UI library, the components, that kind of thing. And then the sprint work starts. Um, people don't have time to work on it. And then little by little things become out of date and then people start to lose trust in it. And then people stop using it altogether. Um, and then no one trusts trusted it at all. So, um, and, and really that's because no one's been, working on it or been given the, the resources to do it. Um, so this is something that, that is, is an important piece. And again, doesn't have to be, it doesn't, that doesn't mean you need a full team on it right away. That can be someone's partial time on it, right? Or a couple people are partial time, right? There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, and the last piece is like really treating design and development as true partners here. Um, it's, it's so important. Like it, it can't just be a designer or a developer who is, who is working on this. It has to be both because it impacts both. Uh, you know, if you think about any product development process, there's the design part and there's the development part. And, and by not having that represented here would be, um, you know, you're just going to have to overcome a lot of problems in the future. Um, when, a, when evolving an existing system, um, you know, look at what you have today, right? Because you may have a lot of things that you, that are really good that you can keep and evolve. Um, and there may be other things that like you can just get rid of and that's fine. Um, but spending some time to do that inventory and audit of that, of that stuff is going to be helpful to understand like, you know, what do you even have today? You may find that you have things that you didn't even know because someone was, you know, had created this thing or is working on something to, to kind of help them themselves or their team. Um, again, like defining a team to do this, to work on this stuff is, is important. Um, developing an execution plan, um, you know, that, that roadmap piece of within that execution plan um, is really for current and future state and thinking about, okay, here's, here's kind of like the MVP stuff we can do um, and, and really planning out releases, right? Like figuring out what you can do today and what you can work towards in the future. Um, and, you know, there's some similar carryover from uh, the previous slide, but like communicating about this stuff, talking about it, um, getting people aware of it, that kind of thing, and involving people as well. Like one of the, one of the best ways to get people to adopt something is to involve them, right? Like people just want to be heard and people have good ideas, right? Like the various product teams will know the most about their product. Um, so they'll be able to contribute in really, really meaningful ways. And by uh, involving those people, again, that, that just increases the likelihood of them adopting it in the future. Um, all right, so I'm looking at time here. So we, we're doing good on time. Um, so that's, that's just a quick overview of like getting started. Um, this could go a lot deeper, but at this point, I think we can um, stop for some Q&A. That's awesome, Sean. Thank you. You can hear me, right? Yep. Awesome. We actually have a pile of questions uh -oh. in Q&A. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hit them. They, uh, some folks have upvoted them, so I'm going to actually hit them in the order that they've been upvoted, so they will be in a order that's not logical to your presentation. <laughs> that's cool. Um, the first one is an anonymous one, so I'll read it myself. Um, and the question here is, and I think this is a good transition from uh, like the, the getting started slides that you had. Um, just someone's asking if all you have is a sketch library, what's the best way to start turning that into a true design system? Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's usually where a lot of this stuff starts. Um, so if you just have a sketch library today, um, that is a good thing to start with, obviously, uh, you know, get a dev partner, 
right? Start working with development. And this is where um, I, I think like the, the sub point within that question is like, yeah, the sketch library isn't enough. And it's like, that's right. right? You need, you need that, that partner on the development side to make sure that those things are coded in a way that, that really represents those things accurately. Um, so I would say the first thing is, is find a dev partner. Um, maybe that's someone on your product team or um, if, if that's not possible, um, you know, maybe start learning some development too, you know, just dive in. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think, I think uh, maybe like tools like abstract would also help in, in that sort of collaboration with the dev side as, as mm -hmm. well to, um, to start working for common libraries and things like that. So that's great. The, um, all right. The second question is from someone named Morty. So I'm going to actually see if I can uh, allow Morty to talk. Morty, you are allowed to speak if you want to. Hi, are you able to hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So to kind of explain my question a little bit, I am a graduating senior who's pretty stressed out. So I wanted to hear your perspective on how you would show potential employers or reviewers how you would demonstrate your experience with design systems, like either via images or how you would describe it if you didn't have visualizers to show them. Mm. That is an amazing question. <laughs> and that's what people say when you ask them a question that stumps them initially. So that's exactly what you just did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Yeah, no. So, um, yeah, I'm, so I'm going to contextualize this. I'm thinking back to when I was like coming out of college and putting a portfolio together, that kind of thing. Um, I think the, the value in showing system work, there may be like a rub here because what it's, it's, un, it's unclear if the people you show this to will understand the value or un, truly understand what a design system is, right? So there's kind of the, the kind of flashier things that they're going to expect to see like uh, the UI library piece, right? Which if you think about it at the beginning of the, of the deck, it's like, all right, this is the first thing you probably think of when you hear design systems. It's like all the component type stuff, right? So that to me, that's like a gimme to be in there. Um, so it's like have those things, whether that's, uh, you know, I don't know if you're a designer or a developer or whatever, but, you know, having examples of that kind of work that you've done, even if it's just like you messing around, right? Um, but then to take it a, a step deeper, I think focusing on the storefront piece, like how they actually like access this thing. Um, and then the strategy piece, like uh, maybe it's even, maybe it's even like a, you know, a, a mock system for like a fake company or like a real company or something like that. Um, and you can use tools like uh, I'm being sensitive to like students here too, like for um, you know, the cost of things. Um, tools like uh, Notion can actually be a really good storefront for this um, because they, they allow a lot of easy editing. They look really good. You can share a link publicly. So you can just like send them a link and be like, here's a design system, right? And they can download files and they can see all the visuals, that kind of thing. Um, and Notion with a student email is free. So, um, you know, even better. So that's, that's how I would frame that. Yeah, if I can jump in and just give one other thought, I, I think, uh, Morty, if you've worked on any kind of collaborative work with any other, um, you know, any other students on any of your project work where, where, you know, two people are sharing the same thing, any way that you can tell the story about how you both worked to be consistent together. Um, and, and that's the tough part of putting together a portfolio at all for anything is that, like, it, it, it's hard for a potential employer to, like, really understand your story. But telling, telling that story in a compelling way in a digital portfolio would really um, would really go a long way for anyone who's, you know, looking to hire someone, uh, even at an entry level to, to start getting familiar with the design system. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you've worked on a group project, just think about, you know, how you would tell the system that you, or how you would, how you would tell the story of, of that kind of collaboration. That's super helpful. Thank you both. Great. Uh, okay. I'm going to go to another anonymous, uh, question. Um, and this is an interesting one. Uh, my clients often get held up by the terminology of design systems, especially because a lot of organizations use different terms for similar things. Clients ask what a component is versus a module or whether they're the same or different, or they ask about the boundaries of a component, like whether an H1 or an icon count as components. So do you have any tips or tricks on uh, sort of coming to terms with the language with clients so that they don't get stuck in these semantic rabbit holes? 
Yeah. Um, so a couple of things there. One is, you know, we started at the beginning like this because this is something we deal with a lot too. Um, where like just these words, like style guides, pattern libraries, like they just, they've been around for a lot longer than the word design system. So people will say different words thinking they mean the same thing that's in your head, but that's act not actually true. Um, so uh, what we've done internally is we don't use, uh, we don't call our, our pattern libraries pattern libraries anymore um, because pattern libraries are for developers, right? And a UI library is for designers and developers, right? So that's, that's kind of like, we're being very intentional about how we're using the language there. Um, and we've even said to, you know, to clients like, Hey, we are being intentional. Here is why we are calling it this, like explaining why we are doing this, not just using these words. Right. Um, I think the other thing too is within the UI piece, uh, you'll notice how we kind of bucket these things because we have this bucket called primitives. Right. And we went through this, a similar process where it's like, is like an icon a component? Like, how do you like name these things? And really like primitives are the things that are, these are in every other component, right? So like every component is gonna have some kind of color to it or typography or spacing, that kind of thing. So we found that separating these out into these, this bucket called primitives that, hey, these are just part of every other component uh, really helps people to understand the difference between what is a quote unquote component and what is not a component. I think that's a, I think that really covers it very well. Um, so here's another, uh, you know, I'm actually going to let this, uh, let this guy ask a question himself. You may recognize him, Sean. <laughs> oh, Daniel. Hey there. How's it going, Sean? It's great to oh, see fun. you guys. Yeah, um, I, had, I had a question. Uh, we, we use something called zero height and, yeah. and consider that probably a storefront. Um, but it, it feels kind of heavy uh, in terms of updating and it's expensive for us. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, would you recommend Confluence or Notion? And how would that interplay with Storybook, which our developers use? Yeah, Dan, I miss you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are I talking a British accent to you? Please. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, zero height is a, for people who don't know, zero height is a, um, it would be considered like an off the shelf storefront tool. So let me, um, let me share my screen again. We'll go back to storefront stuff. Um, so it's more of an off the shelf storefront tool. Um, it's really geared more towards designers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's like integration with sketch. Uh, it's kind of similar ish to like envision DSM a little bit uh, when it comes to the documentation piece. Uh, a lot, so Dan, I have like all these follow-up questions for you, but I think a lot of what the design tools will say, like Envision DSM and uh, Zero Height and stuff, they will promote like, oh, we have integration with like dev tools and stuff. And really it's like the most basic integration possible. They make it sound like it's going to solve all these world problems. It's usually not true. Um, those tend to be more like design focused tools. Um, and can be helpful for the designer specifically. Um, the same way that like Storybook is more of a dev tool and can be helpful for like the developer specifically. So like Dan, like, I, you know, there may be something like Confluence or uh, Notion might be a good way to like connect those two. Mm -hmm. Does your dev team work on something like Storybook? Yeah, they do. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's more so, you know, just, just having one source of truth that's, you know, not so hidden from everybody else. You know, uh, I really like I really like that you brought up Notion. It, it just feels like a something we we have not thought about. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, Notion is like um, pretty incredible with with how you can edit content. Like, it makes editing content so easy. Um, I don't know if you guys use abstract at all, Dan, but mm -hmm. they have like, they just added a, you know, you can easily add like an abstract block to a page, that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, I, I would say like, what's, what's the heaviness as part of, uh, um, zero height? Well, I guess, I guess it's kind of, it's, it's 
stuck with us designers to to update it from from sketch and then there's kind of the disconnect um you know because then we have to relay some of that information to the front end engineers yeah um so you know yeah yeah, yeah just yeah ahead, i'm sorry. wondering if it's more like maybe it's not like a tool problem maybe it's just like a slight process yeah. rejiggering that needs to happen maybe it's just like you know that kind of thing i'm happy to follow up with you on this though dude yeah we should talk yeah, i appreciate yeah. it so. yeah cool all right i'm going to move on to uh, another anonymous attendee asked um would you approach creating a design system for a large marketing site differently than creating one for products um i wouldn't approach it differently the the pieces inside of it might be a little bit different from like a ui perspective um so like your components might be more like uh, we have like an author component, like for a blog post or something, or maybe there's like a, a lead gen component or something like that. Um, but the approach would be exactly the same, right? Because we need to understand like, well, who is this for? Is, is there like multiple marketing teams and stuff within there and even micro sites and stuff? Um, who will be like adopting this system uh does that team have designers do they have developers that kind of stuff um yeah so we would approach it the same it, it would just have slightly different details yeah yeah i think a lot of the components would that, 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 that we put into the product work that we do might not be right. necessary but then you like i mean most of the large marketing just for everyone to know the, the the large marketing site work that we do starts with a pretty extensive content strategy project which which uh not project but you know phase of the work which results in the definition of uh you know content components that that eventually informs the design of the rest of the site so i think that that actually is a, a, a probably a, a bit of a relief for the folks building the design system because you've got uh, an idea of what all these different content components are when you're um when you're building it yeah um uh, here's another question about components. How many times should a uh, component be used before it's documented? Do you include one-off components in your design systems? Um, let me, I think I understand that question. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> I think the question is, should everything be in the system maybe? Like there might be some sub questions here. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so uh, not everything that's within a product needs to be quote unquote, a component in the system. Um, and not every product has to like 100% adopt a system either. Um, there's like levels to adoption, which is its, it's whole other deeper topic. Um, another way you might be asking that question, um, might be that the, you know, when, when, how, how do you identify when something should be like in the system, right? Like, you know, hey, we've been reusing this thing a couple of times. Should that be a reusable component? Um, and if that is your question, then I think the answer is if you're using it more than like a handful of times in various places, it's probably worth putting into a, a you know, a system so that yeah. others can reuse it too. Yeah, and I think this is related to, I, I think I just saw a meme recently about a about this with the design systems. We were, we were all chuckling about it, but the, the, this idea that, you know, you build a design system to make things consistent so people aren't going off the rails. And then the next question that comes along is like, hey, can I build a customized version of this component? Right. That, that just, yeah. you know, yeah. typically comes up. Um, and uh, just, uh, just for everyone's uh, warning, it's four o'clock now, but we're, uh, Sean and I still have another half hour so we can keep going. So we'll try to um, keep going through questions that people are finding value in it. Um, the next question here is from, uh, Mackenzie, uh, I'm going to mangle your last name, and I apologize in advance, but Mackenzie uh, Dysart, maybe? Uh, and I just Dysart, yes, that's right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Mackenzie, you're, you're live. Oh, hooray. You're live um, on Sean Radio. There's my question. Um, basically, I was just wondering, like, how agencies can support adoption of um, design systems when marketing to clients, because I'd say one of the things that's the hardest is hey, client, we're going to, here's a style guide. We kind of start that process. And then they're like, oh, let's just break everything because I want this button to be blue. Um, how can we better educate our clients to get that buy-in and really add that value for them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so one of the things that uh, we kind of joke about this a lot that solving the like design problem or the development problem is actually pretty easy. 
it's all the people involved that are the difficult parts, um, right? Because people come with their own agendas, they have their own goals, that kind of stuff. And um, one of the ways that, that we approach this is to involve them as much as possible. Um, and, you know, even like we, you know, we personally like, we want to find the people who are the biggest naysayers and like, you know, convert them, right? Because they can be such strong advocates for us. So, you know, finding those people, understanding what, you know, if someone wants to make this button blue and not follow the green, be like, oh, you know, what is it about that blue that is going to solve this problem better than the green, right? Like force them to uh, explain their thought process and, it, it kind of helps them to be like, am I just doing this because I just like it better? Or is this actually solving a problem better that, you know, you know, that the green is not right. I know it's like a simple example, but um, kind of putting the question on them and having them talk you through it can actually be really helpful because it makes them think about it and to articulate it. Uh, and then you can kind of bounce between a, a conversation there. That's more of like a consulting problem. But it, yeah. it's very relevant to um, you know all the all the work we do. Yeah, I just yeah. think of the clients that like to break the system, where it's like here's a system that we've been following for two years, and then oh, I don't like it on this one page, so let's change it. And then oh, that's like the I think obviously client battle, but um, just an interesting approach yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and. Uh, and I, th I just want to interject, um, and I'll I'll cut off your mic, Mackenzie, and then get to someone else after I give my little tirade here. But but um, you know, uh, one of the points that Sean made early on, which is something that really changed my view of design systems, is that you're you're building an, a product in inside of your company. Your organization now has a product, and the the end users of that product are the designers and developers and 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 product owners and uh, product managers of that system. And so. Um, every product evolves over time. And so there's, there's uh, I, I remember uh, one of the first exposures we had to design systems a long time ago, we were developing a one product in a multi, multi suite, uh, uh, multiple product suite of products for uh, uh, a company with an HR system. And, um, you know, we were, we were required to abide by their existing design system. But meanwhile, we were building all of the data visualization tools within that system first. So they had no patterns, no modules or components or anything within their design system that reflected um, data visualization. And so that was our domain. Of course, we had to stick with the palettes and things like that. But once we started hitting the boundaries of what, was, what existed in the design system, we need to create some really sophisticated palettes and rules around how palettes progress through different data visualization situations. Um, we became the experts in data visualization that the owners of the product of the design system would defer to us. Um, but at the same time, there were times we needed to, to veer from what they were doing. So their rule was like, if you're, if you're veering from what we're doing, then um, there has to be a good reason for it. And so we got used to sort of justifying that and explaining it to them um, and, and helping the whole design system evolve. And I'm, I'm going to jump over to um, uh, someone named Bon who, uh, is asking a similar question. So if Bon's still on, I don't know if he's still on, but um, Bon, I just made you live. So if you wanna ask your question, that'd be great. Sure, um, my question is, uh, what are the most scalable methods for evangelizing and enforcing a design system, especially across larger enterprise companies? And uh, my context for that question was for almost two years, um, I was one of the lead evangelists for Amazon's retail design system and to wow. your to the point that you just made, pretty much most of my time spent with people trying to convince them <laughs> and listening to them. Um, so I'm very, very curious how, how what, what uh, you would recommend. Yeah. 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 And uh, Bon, you hit on the, the fact that like being on a systems team, it is product development and you're part salesperson as well. Um, and you know, you need people to buy your product and use your product, that kind of thing. Right. It just, it, <clears throat> that analogy seems weird to people because it's like, oh, well, it's like this internal tool and it's like, yeah, but at really large organization, organizations, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, so to, to actually answer your question, um, one of the things is like uh, figuring out, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the politician, like, oh, you say like, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies thing. Um, but kind of to the previous question, it's, 
it's not something like enforcing a design system is it can't be a dictatorship, right? So especially at large companies, you have a lot of different product teams. They may have varying or even competing incentives um, and metrics that they have to hit that kind of stuff. And if you're coming in with a design system and that design system either doesn't align with those or just completely ignores those, um, it's, it's going to be difficult for that team to buy into it, right? Maybe the people on the ground want it. Um, but the other part is like the, the people like running the product are like, no, like you're going to kill my burn rate. You're going to, you're going to mess up my bonus, that kind of thing. So that's why I like spending that time up front and understanding like, what are these products trying to do and what are their goals, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, is really important so that when you sell this thing, you are selling it in a way that actually aligns with what they want and need. Um, and the other part too is like, there's other models to this. One idea is like, uh, Slack is such an interesting analog, like looking at how other products have successfully uh, grown in the enterprise market is really interesting, right? So one is Slack where they did not come in and try and sell to the people who buy stuff. They came in at the very bottom and then people were like, this is awesome. Like, this is so much better than any Microsoft thing that we've been using or whatever. And we're just going to start using it, right? So they had all these teams just using it. And then IT, <laughs> IT had to like figure out like, all right, how do we like people, everyone's using Slack. Like, how do we, how do we make sure this is safe? And then the other model is, is like Box, right? Which is like the competitor Dropbox, which is they intentionally built their product around selling to enterprises. Um, and I don't know if anyone's ever used Box, but like it feels that way, right? Like the product, if you compare it to Dropbox, does not feel like this like beautifully designed and, and, and fun product to use. It, it's like an enterprise product, right? They are both very successful in enterprise environments, but they have very different approaches to their product strategy and, and getting people to adopt it. Um, so for a system, there's similar approaches where you can try and, uh, you know, start at the top and kind of sell to those people and then get others to adopt. Um, or it can be more grassroots, right. And just be like, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention to like the product owners. I'm going to talk to the people on the ground who are doing the work and just give them these tools and make it really easy for them to do their work. And then that can kind of fuel adoption too. Um, but again, that's why it's like so important to really treat this as a product because there's so many product analogs to look at and learn from in making this kind of work successful. Yeah. I, just to add to that, Bon, I think, um, uh, well, I mean, your experience at Amazon, you know, yeah. is, is uh, you, you could probably tell us volumes about, um, about having to get that stuff done there. The, the resources that I often point our clients to um, when we're trying to answer questions like this, the, the first thing I'll do is uh, refer them over to the Design Genome Project, which was a project uh, you know, executed by InVision for, uh, I think it was a one-year uh, study on how work gets done and uh, work flows through organizations, uh, through design organizations. Um, it's still available online uh, and, and they have like, you know, three basic structures for, for how stuff gets done. But this, is, this, this would inform how you would uh, evangelize your design system within an organization. So they have like a, you know, centralized, a decentralized and a hybrid form of, um, of design structures and organizations that they promote. And then the second uh, resource that I often point our clients to, or that we use to help our consult with our clients on that is, um, uh, the the book org design for design orgs or design orgs for org designer it, it, it's an O'Reilly book it's it's some name like that but but it's really you know looking again at this question of how does work actually get done successfully in different structures of organizations because the answer is like it, it depends you know it depends on on the I'm sure Amazon uh, you know enforces and, and manages their design systems differently than than you you would see at Google or um, you know Box or Dropbox or USAA or all those different organizations. Um, I'm going to jump over to, let's see, we answered Bond's question. Uh, we'll go back up to the top and um, uh, oh, we answered Mackenzie's question. So we're getting close. Uh, Carissa, I'm going to see if Carissa is still on. And if she is, let's see if she wants to ask her question. Hey, yep, I'm here. Great. I'm here. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so I'm curious about once you have a design system in place for the web, uh, can you leverage it and scale it to be used across multiple channels, for example, like print, social media, 
presentations? Um, and if so, what's the best way to approach it? Um, I'm asking because I came from a UX role where we had a nice design system in place. I moved to a design strategist role where I'm now supporting all those other mediums. And I'm trying to find out if I can leverage the design system that we have for the web and somehow apply that to these other channels because we don't currently have a strong, strong guidelines for those other channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can definitely do this. Uh, <clears throat> you can do it across, you know, marketing, the presentation stuff that you're talking about product, that kind of thing. And even within the product side, you can do that across platforms too. So from like web to iOS to Android, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that we've done in the past is when we've known ahead of time that that is going to be, that's like part of the goal. Um, we set up this kind of like foundational layer at the top where, okay, most of these other uh, platforms or environments are going to need the same stuff when it comes to colors, typography, iconography, um, maybe like photography, illustration, that kind of thing. Um, so there's kind of like those kind of core foundational elements that, that are going to be there for everyone. And then from there, you can start to like create these little like subunits of like, oh, okay. So from the foundation, we're going to leverage and just have this like marketing one. And then like the product one that's like web focused. And then like uh, the internal, I don't know what you would call like the um, internal presentation stuff. That's like, it's like kind of marketing, but like internal marketing in a way. Um, but like those kind of materials. So you can, you can almost create like these subsystems underneath like that parent system in a way. Um, and actually like a good, a good analog to this, which um, it's, it's more on the product side, but uh, Spotify recently talked about how they've structured their design system work where they initially uh, tried to just have one system that every team used regardless of what platform they were on. And it turns out that that just didn't work well for them. Um, so now they have this like this like universe of systems, right? That are aware of each other and some talk to each other, but there there may be even some dependencies between them, that kind of thing. But it's a much more flexible way and much more realistic way for those teams to actually use that stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, just to build on that, we do we have uh, I know. Um, uh, we have a lot of clients where we are working on internal employee based systems for them. And they also have client facing systems and, you know, multiple business units with multiple product types and things like that. And the, and the notion of unifying all those design systems for them uh, under one, you know, uh, comprehensive system, I think would, would just, it, it would be a nightmare to pull off. So that, so they, you know, things, things are clearly cordoning off into like different um, e even different internal products or external products. And, and there might be some unification, uh, just as far as like, you know, the, the primitives are concerned, but then, then when you get beyond that, it, um, you know, they start to convert or uh, start to diverge. Um, I think, well, you know, we have one more very patient, uh, person with a question, uh, Leon. So I'm going to see if Leon's still with us. Hey, Leon, I just unmuted you. Are you with us? Hey, uh, yes, I am. All right. You want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, first off, great talk. I really, appreciated this talk very verifying on many levels so it's been great um so my question is about building a design team and obviously especially right now it's probably very tough to get resources especially full-time um so if a team is starting off in their designers but they're not able to get a developer on that team how can they be successful? And I mean like a design system team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> essentially like having, you know, we've done the reverse where there's a design system with no designers. Um, and it sounds like maybe you're asking like, how do you have a design system with no developers? Is that kind of, kind of your question a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Cause like you might not like, I have a design system team. We're starting off. Yeah. We have we have UX guidelines that we've built for a while, but now we want to expand that into a design system and build that out within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, but getting a full-time designer, a developer might not happen right away. Right. Um, and there could be, you know, it's also very tough to get uh, development resource help from other teams because they're busy. Also, they have their own roadmaps and whatnot. 
Yeah. And I'll be honest, like I, I'm not really gonna start <laughs> learning how to code. <laughs> I just that's not in my like I, I know a bit about HTML. I used to do HTML stuff back in the day, but you know, um, my role is not about that right now. I mean, I'm interested in it, but I definitely won't be mm -hmm. you know, spending a lot of time investing in that and probably my designers as well. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, what, is there any other creative ways to go about it? Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. About. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I can just give you my perspective on how I would approach it. Um, and you know, take it with a grain of salt. Right. Sure. Um, so if we didn't have any, deve uh, any developers on the systems team, but we still wanted to you know, promote this system and have it used, um, I would spend a lot of time building relationships with the developers on those product teams. Um, okay. And that, that might be, <clears throat> excuse me, um, having like the designers on your team, you know, kind of sit with them as they're building features and implementing maybe some of those components um, that are, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that those developers are referencing these designs as they're building. Is that, is that true? Um, they are for the most part, I mean, okay. especially the teams that are working with designers, but the teams that aren't might be spinning up their own concoctions. You know what I mean? So sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, that's where I think like, you know, for a developer, even having design guidelines is still super helpful, right? Even if they can't, you know, if it's like, oh, you know, we don't have code we can grab, we still have to write it. At least they have the design guidelines and can talk to the designer and work with them to um, implement the thing, or maybe there's some nuances that uh, can be improved upon that kind of stuff. So, you know, having that relationship there is, is actually still really valuable, even if there's no code that they can pull. Um, so I would still, you know, have, have the design team work with those developers as, as much as, as much as they can to just build those relationships and, and to help that those developers like adopt this stuff, you know? Sounds cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. I, I mean, I think that's, that, that, that's a great, um, point that you make, Sean. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we've seen this so many times where, um, we, we start to talk with our clients about design systems and the, the, the dev side of the business is, is you know left out of the conversation in the initial you know scoping of the work and and we experience uh, a lot of anxiety from the developers when we go in there and start they start thinking oh you're going to systematize my work and nobody's even talked to me about it and the first thing that the first thing that we do is you know sit down with them and start to learn and understand their goals and and, and needs as well because the design system really is there to serve them as much as it is to, to serve the the designers and the product itself so it's just it's it's really important to be building those relationships. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sean, we have um, uh, two, uh, two more questions. Um, they're, they're actually, well, one, one may not be very simple, uh, and, and uh, it was posted in the chat room, so I missed it earlier, but um, someone's asking if you can import code into Confluence. And I know that a couple of our clients, we've built um, design system documentation storefronts in, in Confluence. Does the code live in Confluence when we do that, or does the code live, live elsewhere? The code will usually live elsewhere. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, like what we'll usually do is if Confluence is the storefront, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that like every bit of content needs to be in Confluence. Like you can link out to something like Storybook, which has the code um, and, and stuff there. So like you can, like Confluence has a code block where you can put code in there, but something like Storybook is just purpose built for you know, kind of stress testing a component and, and building it in there and, you know, showing various states with data in it and that kind of thing. So it's just a much better tool for that kind of stuff. Um, if, you know, if like you couldn't do that, um, I mean, you can technically put code in Confluence, but there, there's definitely better options out there. Yeah, it doesn't, it, 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 it's, it's kind of a hack to try to get it to import easily in there and things. Um, and the last question is a real simple one. Um, can you uh, mention the book that you, uh, that you mentioned in the, in the beginning again, someone missed that. And I, I know it'll be in the resources list that we send out, but. Oh yeah. Um, it's called a pattern language here. I'll show you. I'll show you the slide so you can see what it looks like again, but yeah, we're going to be sending out links to all this stuff. So you'll, you'll be able to go get it, but that is the book. Yep. It's very thick too. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope, you, hope you like the read. Awesome.
All right. Well, I, that that gets to all the uh, all the questions. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say, Sean, but I can uh, pull up the last slide of. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you, here. everyone, for attending and staying a little bit longer and for asking questions and stuff like that. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna uh, thanks everyone. This this has been great. It's been a really it's been a wonderful interactive uh, conversation, um, and we really appreciate everyone's uh, participation and, uh, um, and and engagement in it. So. Uh, just a, a final note, um, we're, as Sean mentioned, we're going to be sending a follow-up email soon uh, with links to everything that Sean referenced in this webinar, um, along with a link to the recording. So if you want to uh, review it again or, or share it with others, it's available there. Um, we're, we'd love to collect feedback on all of our webinars, so it'll take about two minutes to fill out a survey, and there's a link there for the survey. Um, I think someone's posting this, uh, these notes in chat, too, as well, if you want to um, follow up on them. Um, additionally, uh, if you want to set up a, a coffee with virtual coffee with Sean, we're doing that with anyone who uh, hosts our webinars. So uh, you can go to thinkpo.st slash virtual coffee, Sean, follow that link and, um, and uh, get to spend some time with Sean, have a conversation with him. And don't forget to register for our upcoming webinar, uh, Creative Work at a Distance with uh, Dan Singer as our host. Um, and uh, some of our thinkers, Allison Drexler, Daniel Trace, and Ryan Colleen will be participating in that. So thank you everyone for uh, participating in this. I hope you're, uh, you're all safe and healthy at home in your quarantine and, uh, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it.